These are not prisoners. They're immigrants. Most of them are asylum seekers, and they are trapped in what has become the world's largest immigrant detention system. ¿Por qué si nosotros no somos criminales, no somos asesinos, por qué estamos en las prisiones? Solamente vinimos pidiendo un derecho humano. They're coming to the United States seeking asylum and then they're being incarcerated and they're being put in these detention centers in the middle of nowhere. It's happened so quickly and it's happening so far outside of these metropolitan areas where most people would never ever have the occasion to go. This is happening literally in our backyard, but no one knows about it. Prison-like facilities like these are popping up and rapidly expanding across the southern U.S. But no state has seen its immigrant detention capacity spike so quickly as Louisiana which has begun turning former jails into immigrant detention facilities. This is a complete betrayal of our commitment to decarceration in Louisiana. And if you're locked up in one of these ICE facilities and don't have access to an attorney, your chances of being deported are very high. Six out of 100 people get asylum if they're detained in Louisiana. 96% of cases in Louisiana where someone doesn't have an attorney ends up in a deportation. Camaro Lopez is an immigration attorney who drives hours from his home in New Orleans every week in order to provide legal services for ICE detainees, who are tucked away in these rural facilities that are harder to reach. The deck is stacked against them, and so it's the entire system is designed in a way to make it impossible for people to really fight their cases and be able to win. It's intended to make people give up. This is what a typical day looks like for Camaro, as he balances traveling hours to assist ICE detainees, while also trying to make it back home in enough time to see his own family. Camaro has represented detained immigrants in Louisiana for years. We're violating people's rights by having them detained like this and treating them like animals. What we're doing is traumatizing people, putting them in detention, trying to force them to give up instead of being the welcoming country that we're supposed to be. I don't think most people in Louisiana or even necessarily nationally know that the majority of the people being detained are asylum seekers. People that either turned themselves in at the border or were caught soon after crossing and have been sent to Louisiana to await their asylum case. Not people that have committed a crime. So I leave my house in the mornings, um, get on the road, typically just try to power all the way through to the detention center, depending on which one I'm going to. If I get hungry or something, I'll stop and get some food, but generally I just power through to try to get to the detention center as quickly as possible. We typically go only to Pine Prairie, and so that's about a three, three and a half hour drive. Um, today we're making the trip up to Jackson for some special cases, and so that's a four and a half hour, five hour, depending on traffic, drive. Yeah, Jackson Parish is a new facility that opened up, I think it was towards the end of last year, possibly early this year, and it, um, it's holding primarily or exclusively asylum seekers. Asylum seekers like Dixon, who fled Cuba and was locked up in an ICE detention facility in Pine Prairie, Louisiana. Sí, son así. Muchas personas son muy buenas, que trabajan en esos lugares, sí tienen buen corazón y son muy, muy buenas personas, pero hay muchos también que sí son racistas. Y sí estaba un poco preparado ya para lo que me iba a enfrentar ya, porque oía cuentos de las personas diciendo de que no era fácil, que, que si te tocaba estar mucho tiempo ahí adentro era un infierno. A veces te daban una jamonada que estaba podrida y cuando te dan un... que lo que mejor quedaba a mí era el pollo. La mayoría de las veces estaba crudo, pero tenías que comértelo, no había otra. No te puedes quejar. I'm coming to see four people. One of them is a client of ours that has his final hearing coming up in early November. And so I'm just finally prep preparing him for the last process. And then another one I'm signing on, he's going to be a client. And the other two, I'm helping some colleagues get some documents signed for him, for them, so that they can use for their hearings. How you doing, sir? I'm all right. The number of immigrants being detained in the United States has reached its highest levels ever, at just over 50,000. And while these detentions didn't begin under President Trump, his administration has drastically expanded the program. Over the last year in Louisiana alone, the number of detained immigrants has risen from an estimated 2,000 to over 8,000. 
meaning the state accounts for about one in six detainees nationwide. But why Louisiana? In the 1990s, a lawsuit led to a settlement in which there had been a number of problems with overcrowding in the state prisons. And the solution to that was to open up a number of local parish prisons across the state. At first, the idea of having a bunch of different parish prisons across the state seemed like a positive one. You were going to lower the number of folks who were in the state facilities, address overcrowding, Instead, what you found was that more and more areas of the state of Louisiana became financially dependent upon the money they were getting from the Department of Corrections to run local parish prisons. And that economic dependence, among other things, paved the way for Louisiana to become the world's highest incarcerator per capita. The problem with incarceration in Louisiana, I best describe it as a cancer that metastasized throughout every aspect of the system. So we really had just a confluence of factors that contributed to this incredibly high incarceration rate, which was almost double the national average. In 2017, the state passed a number of progressive criminal justice reforms that were intended to reduce the state's prison population. And for the most part, they worked. The state's incarcerated population dropped by an estimated 3,000 people. Were you expecting a federal agency like ICE to come into these local parish prisons and fill up these jails? I don't think that that's something that we considered at all. One person who was influential in passing these reforms was Walt Leger, the top-ranking Democrat in Louisiana's House of Representatives. We sat down with the outgoing lawmaker to talk about the unintended consequences of these reforms. We saw a decrease of, what, an estimated 3,000 and the incarceration rate, and drop, that dropped Louisiana to number two. Right. But within the last six months, ICE has come in and filled up these jails with an estimated 8,000. Is it fair to say that Louisiana is not the prison capital of the states and then the prison capital of the world if you're incarcerating more bodies, they're just not in the state system? I, I don't know how the numbers compare to the other states and, and how they stack up. But, um, but certainly, I, it, I guess it just depends on how you measure it. You know, I mean, uh, Louisiana the state is of the number one detainer of asylum seekers next to Texas. And the state of Louisiana has virtually no authority to prevent the federal government from inserting those detainees into facilities in Louisiana. But there's a reason why they're specifically drawn to Louisiana. I'm not sure why Louisiana is such an attractive place to, to do business uh, for uh, the federal government and for these detainees. Certainly, it certainly does not make me comfortable that people who are legally seeking asylum are being detained in prison facilities. I think there's a better way to do that. And I think Congress needs to figure that out quickly because it's just it just doesn't seem like the American way. But the state could ban private for-profit prisons like California has recently done. Do you think that that is something that should be addressed in the state? Like, I think it has been addressed over the years. I believe that there are less here now than there were 10 years ago. And I think there's probably going to be a move uh, to continue to move in that direction. But I certainly don't think that that should be a for-profit venture. This is a complete betrayal of our commitment to decarceration in Louisiana. I think it's infuriating to know that we worked so hard to reduce the incarcerated population only to have folks who are innocent, who are seeking asylum, people who are fleeing violence, all kinds of harms in their home country to be subject to the kinds of conditions that we know exist in some of these facilities. It's very frustrating and I can say that we never ever intended this to happen. The other piece is that a lot of what's happening in this state has to do with private prison companies operating these facilities. And so there has to be some advocacy around bringing attention to the fact that this is a profit motive driven problem. We have sheriffs who have essentially open vacant beds that they realize now that the state would pay them $24.39 to keep a Louisiana citizen in that bed, but ICE will pay them almost $70 to have an immigrant person in that bed. That is a perverse financial incentive that people are terming as a blessing. This system has led to an influx of thousands of ICE detainees into the state. It has stretched lawyers like Homero, who are unable to keep up with all the new cases, to their limits. And that almost surely means that the more immigrants ICE moves into Louisiana, the more deportations will happen as a result of it. 
now I'm heading to Pine Prairie to go visit with clients and do a couple of intakes with some potential new clients. It's one of the older detention centers that was here before the big expansion happened. And it's the detention center where we dedicate the majority of our time and the majority of our resources. We believe that people in immigration proceedings should have an attorney. And at the moment, they're not entitled to an attorney. They have the right to an attorney if they can afford one or find one for free, but they're not entitled to an attorney. There are so many cases where you see people just get steamrolled through the process because they don't have an attorney. 96% of cases in Louisiana where someone doesn't have an attorney ends up in a deportation. Eh, mi hermana lo llamó y en la primera llamada que le hizo, él cogió el teléfono y en el momento que ella le planteó mi caso, al momento le dijo que sí. Y me defendió y en este lugar que estoy ahora es gracias a él. Eso se lo digo yo de por vida. Homero helped Dixon win his asylum case, making him one of the lucky few to leave Pine Prairie as a free man and not in deportation. After driving hours to meet his clients, sometimes things don't go as planned. So my list for today was 22 people, and I was able to see 15 of those 22. When stuff like that happens, it really feels sh like it's there's nothing I can really do about it. And it makes you feel really powerless and impotent. Um, and then like I'm gonna miss time with my daughter as I'm trying to get back as quickly as possible to see her before she goes down for you know for the night. And for the thousands of other immigrants tucked away in rural Louisiana, who will never have access to a lawyer like Camaro, their chances of remaining in the U.S. are slim to none. Who I'm angry at right now is the overall system. I mean, yes, the president in particular is making this happen, but it's a systemic problem that we have at a bureaucratic level that the immigration system is designed to work this way and to frustrate efforts to help immigrants, the deck is stacked against them. And so it's the entire system is designed in a way to make it impossible for people to really fight their cases and be able to win. And it want, it's, it's intended to make people give up. And so, you know, not giving up and fighting back against that is, you know, step number one. And so if I can sacrifice a little bit of my, you know, privilege and go and do that, then why not? The alternative to there being no pro bono representation is a lot more people being deported without any kind of due process.